Hello everybody and welcome to another entry in my series of cool cars for young people. And today's car is a real rarity. It's a 2005 Volkswagen Lupo GTI. The Lupo in of itself is actually a bit of an odd duck because it's almost an evolutionary dead end. Officially speaking, it has no predecessor or successor. Although there are of course other cars you could see as being both of those things. Officially speaking, it's the Fox which replaced this car in the Volkswagen lineup. That was a car developed by the Brazilian arm of VW as an economical runabout and therefore has absolutely no connection to the Lupo whatsoever. The reason for the Lupo coming into being is one as old as time. Car manufacturers seem to insist on making every new generation of their cars a little bit bigger and better than the previous one. And that's all well and good until you remember that your small car is no longer a small car. That's exactly what happened with the VW Polo and the board realised that that car was now too large and expensive for some of their buyers. Enter the Lupo, built on a shortened Polo platform. VW internal politics is never simple though, and technically speaking this is actually a reworked version of the Seat Arossa, which came out a year before. Of course Seat being one of VW's brands, you could argue that it's still very much a VW car rather than a Seat, but I'll leave you to discuss that in the comments section down below. The Lupo was available in a refreshingly small number of configurations. You had a smattering of both petrol and diesel engines and only a few trim levels. To begin with you had the E and then S trim and this is from a time where things like painted door handles and electric windows were considered optional extras. So your S trim did get you extra things but not anything particularly amazing by the standards of today. There was then a Lupo Sport with a 100 horsepower engine, but it was in 2000 that the GTI finally arrived, although only a handful were actually delivered that year. Up front powering this car is a 1.6 litre naturally aspirated twin cam engine, making 125 horsepower. That's actually 10 horsepower more than the Up GTI, of which this car's owner Chris also has an example. That car is about as close a direct descendant to this as you're ever going to find, and while I enjoyed the Up GTI, I think it's fair to say that I wasn't in love with it. This though, I'm actually really rather enjoying, and in typical VW early noughties fashion, it's actually a much more special thing than you would initially realise. I first thought that a Lupo GTI is simply going to be a normal Lupo with a couple of options and a slightly fruitier engine. In some ways that is correct, however it's so much more than just that. In terms of bodywork, it's actually only the tailgate that's shared between this car and your regular Lupo. So the bonnet, the wings, the doors are lightweight aluminium. Elsewhere, thinner steel has been used. And although this car is not actually any lighter than a base Lupo, it hasn't put on any weight either. And it's still pretty trim at about 930 kilos. But that is still pretty porky compared to the ultra special and rare Lupo 3L, which is a very close relative of the Audi A2 3L. That was an ultra economical borderline concept car that if you were in Europe, you could actually buy. That had a specially designed 1.2 litre three cylinder diesel engine. It had what VW called a Tiptronic gearbox, but we'd actually now call it a single clutch automated manual, so an Artronic system if you will. It had even lighter bodywork and some specially designed pieces to make it ultra fuel efficient. 3L being a reference to three litres per 100 kilometres. That's about 100 miles to the gallon. And a few people actually did achieve that economy from them. One person even doing a trip and getting about 120 miles to the gallon. That's phenomenal. And what's even more impressive is that with the A2, that whole platform was designed from the ground up to be economical, to be aerodynamically efficient, to be slippery. Whereas this was not, this was just built as cheap and economical transport. Although the base Lupo may have been affordable, the GTI was still fairly pricey for its day. So one of these new would have set you back about 13,000 quid. 
Unfortunately for VW, this debuted at more or less exactly the same time as the new Mini. That was even more money again, however, it was sexy, it was fast, it was exciting, and that's the car that really, I think, stole the Lupo's thunder. It's probably one of the many reasons that only about a thousand of these actually ever found their way to Britain. I love rare cars and this morning when I checked Auto Trader for pricing information on these, there was only one Lupo GTI for sale out of 14 Lupos in total. This Lupo is a 2005, so one of the very last made. And the crazy thing is, I think it actually looks more youthful than the Fox which replaced it. That to me just looks a little bit odd. It helps that the GTI has these subtle flared arches. I quite like the alloy wheels. In Europe, you could get some different ones as an optional extra. Unfortunately, many of the other parts bespoke to the GTI are not quite so easy to find. So doors, bonnets, that kind of stuff have been unavailable for quite some time. In the event of an accident, it has been known for insurance companies or cheeky garages to simply put the original steel items on. And that really does ruin the whole ethos of the car. So if you're going to buy one of these, do check that it has got all of the correct bits on it. A magnet will be very useful. If you are thinking about buying one of these, because they were a vehicle aimed at the younger buyer who wanted something a little bit sporty, do make sure it hasn't got a history of poor modifications or being ragged all the live long day. Luckily, these seem to have proven quite durable. And when I checked for some buyer's guides, there were very few things that you actually need to look out for. The biggest issue seemed to have been corrosion, particularly around the spoiler at the back. Apparently, there was an issue with the way these were built, and so many wound up getting sold with a little bit of moisture already in them. That meant no matter what you did or how well you looked after the car, you were going to get some corrosion at some point. Chris has now had this car for seven years, and one of the biggest items he had to tend to was that exhaust. It wasn't an aftermarket item, it had simply worn out. That was about £600, and beyond that, he's never really had to spend all that much on it. Routine servicing is cheap, as you might hope for, but do watch out for cam belt services, because there are two of those, so it's just a little bit more money than you might expect. In terms of insurance, these were always designed to be relatively cheap, but this one is actually now on a modern classic policy with an agreed valuation, because some insurers have realised that things like this are worth money. So he's paying around £400 a year for insurance, but I expect you could probably find it for a bit less. In terms of overall specification, this car is good, if not great. You have a sunroof, which I like, but you don't appear to have air conditioning, which is a shame. You also have only a cassette player here, rather than the optional CD. And these seats are pretty decent, but the interior in general is not especially remarkable. Over the years, a few changes were made to the car. The five-speed gearbox was replaced with a six. Very light, but accurate, with just the right amount of notchiness, and it's actually a proper joy. You also got a slightly more environmentally friendly engine, so later ones met Euro 4 certification, and that is important if you want to go into certain city centres without being fined. As an overall package, it's unsurprisingly similar to the regular Lupo. So rear seat space is not great, boot space is very compromised. He's even got an official Lupo bag for this, which is sort of boot tidy of sorts. And visibility is excellent. The A-pillar is almost cliff-like, it just seems to drop off into nothingness, and the windows are practically on the floor. I'm getting real shades of K12 Micra in here. And to a lot of young people, I'm sure, this would seem a somewhat unremarkable car. But, I assure you, when you get this on a proper road, it's absolutely sensational. This is easily one of the most fun, best driving, small, affordable cars I've ever experienced. It doesn't have that sort of puppy dog nature of a mini John Cooper works, but it's still fairly agile. The steering's actually got real, genuine feel to it. It's got a delicious weighting, absolutely gorgeous. The engine also has quite a bit of punch. I've yet to rev it out, but the mid-range is quite strong, and because there's almost no weight to this thing, it doesn't need a lot of power to get it going. Now it's grip-like, mixed conditions today because it started raining just as I began filming. Oh yeah, fantastic. It even sounds pretty good too, this stock exhaust. Actually really quite fruity. It does take a while to get to the old red line. <laughs> Heel and toe 
not the easiest because the pedals are still sort of city car spacing. But you can really beat on this car and it loves it. Grip level's good, you know. Oh, there we go, that was the edge of it. No limited slip diff, you can tell it started spinning one wheel. Right, really well too. Strikes a brilliant balance between comfort and sportiness. Goes over these bumps, no trouble at all. Even those small imperfections in the road, which can often be a real issue for smaller cars with short wheelbases, are no trouble whatsoever. Because it's tiny, you can also afford to take certain liberties in corners that you just couldn't in a larger car. You can actually alter your line in a bend without going onto the other side of the road. Fuel economy is reasonable too, thanks to the light weight of the car. So you'll get over 40 to the gallon on a run. This car's really taken me by surprise, I have to say. The dash is pretty simple. You've got your taco on the left, speed on the right, little clock in the middle, and some very, very basic digital displays. But that's all you really need in a car like this. Braking is by discs all round, unlike the Up GTI, which gets drums at the rear. They are functional, if not spectacular. A common or garden variety Lupo could be had now from about a thousand pounds or so, maybe a bit less if you're willing to get a really ropey one. But the GTI has held its money very well. Considering they cost about 13,000 pound new, the only ones I could find for sale were still about five to seven grand, with particularly good examples potentially being a little bit more. That means it's not quite the same bargain as some other cars that I've experienced in this series. An early Mini, which might have cost more when new, you can now certainly get for less. The Skoda Fabia VRS that I drove, again, you can pick up one of those for about two to three grand. They are even more efficient thanks to being a diesel, but they don't have the excitement or the verve of this. This still feels in all the ways that I think matter to us petrol heady types like a real old school performance car. A lot of people saw the Up GTI as being a modern rebirth of the original Mark I Golf GTI, but for me, that was never really a very valid comparison. The Up, to me, didn't really have that same sort of puppy dog enthusiasm that I found in the Golf. It didn't give me the confidence to push on that this does, and I don't think you can ever really see a one litre, three cylinder turbocharged engine as a worthy successor to the Golf's iconic power plant. This has far more of that old school twin cam feeling about it. You put your foot down like I did just there at 30 mile an hour and it's got quite a bit of go in it. It feels really quite healthy, far healthier than the 125 horsepower number might imply. Conclusion time then. Yes, the price of entry into a Lupo GTI may be a little bit more than you would expect. Likewise, if maintenance is cheap, should the car suffer an accident, you might find repairing it is not economical at all. It's also somewhat compromised in space, boot space particularly, but that's always going to be an issue with cars in this category. Without a doubt, this car is at its weakest as a cruiser. Very little insulation in here and a relatively light car means that tire roar is a constant issue. As far as I'm concerned, the chunky, almost baby RS4 kind of looks. Incidentally, these window switches, same as a B5 RS4. This peppy engine, the excellent visibility, and the rarity factor mean that for me, the Lupo GTI is one of the coolest cars for young people I've driven in quite some time, and well worth, if you can afford it, the extra outlay over an old Mini. I know some will say that I'm crazy, but I think this car genuinely deserves a place alongside the all-time hot hatch greats. A 205 GTI, Renault Clio Williams, one of these, this would not look out of place. Trust me, if you haven't tried one, don't knock it. So a big thank you to Chris for bringing his car out. Thanks to you for watching. Please like, comment down below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.